Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. I would like to begin by reading from this beautiful book of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art put out by the Bible Society in 2017 uh, called Our Mob, God's Story. This is from the foreword by Miriam Rose Ungenmer Bowman of Daly River, Northern Territory. Our Aboriginal culture has taught us to be still and to wait. We do not try to hurry things up. We let them follow their natural course, like the seasons. We watch the moon in each of its phases. We wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water the thirsty earth. When twilight comes, we prepare for the night. At dawn, we rise with the sun. There are deep springs within each of us. Within this deep spring, which is the very spirit of God, is a sound, the sound of deep calling to deep, the sound of the word of God, Jesus. I wanted to read that because in recent years, white people like me have started to listen to the call of indigenous communities to live lives that are more in tune with our natural environment, to pay attention to its rhythms and to find through our attentiveness that we are also becoming more in tune with God. I say we have just begun to do that, but our readings this morning, every one of them, shows us that being in tune with our environment has been very much a part of our Judeo-Christian background right from the start. It's not something new that we are learning for the first time from our Indigenous friends. In our Genesis reading, we find Jacob on his way to find a wife to be his partner in building the family that will become the blessing of the whole world. He has recently gained his birthright by tricking his slightly older twin brother with a bowl of soup. Somehow, though he is sneaky and dishonest, God appears to him and tells him that the promises made to Abraham and Isaac will continue to apply to him and to his descendants. God is like that, as we have seen before. There was nothing special about Isaac. There was nothing special about Abraham. There is nothing special about Jacob. Yet here he is, the son of promise, passing through the land of promise, and he is met by the God who is faithful to promises. Did you notice his pillow? We need to remember that soft, fluffy pillows are a very recent innovation. Unlike us, soft Westerners, Jacob was able to get to sleep with his head on a rock. The rock meant nothing to him apart from his need to put his head somewhere to sleep. He was passing through a place, a land that meant nothing to him other than the need to get through it to his destination. But God met him in this seemingly meaningless place. And that rock pillow became a pillar to remind him and others of God's presence. God is not limited by church buildings or temples. God can meet people anywhere and the most ordinary of objects can direct attention to God. This is a beautiful truth, but the author of Psalm 113, sorry, 139, discovered it is a scary truth if you are trying to escape from God. I've met lots of people who are trying to escape from God. People who won't come through a church door because the angry, vengeful God that they believe in might drop a ceiling panel on them. People who believe in an angry God like that like to think that God can be safely contained within a building 
and will leave the rest of the world alone. But it's not like that. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle on the furthest limits of the sea, even there. Though I climb to the top of Sky Tower, though I ride a whale off Stradbroke Island or drink Forex at the Birdsville pub, even there, even there, there are no secular spaces. God can find us anywhere, which can be scary for people who believe in a scary God. But as the author of Psalm 139 discovered, when the God you can't escape finds you, it will not be to hurt you, but to guide you, to hold you safe, and to turn your darkness into light. You can't escape from God, but that's okay, because once you have met God, you know there's no reason to escape. In the Gospel reading, Matthew shows us that wisdom can be found by contemplating nature. Why is there evil in the world? Why doesn't God just get rid of it? Well, philosophers could argue about that for centuries, and they have. Or you can go for a walk in your garden, and you can notice that sometimes there are weeds that just can't be killed without damaging the good plants. Think of those times, if you're anything like me in your gardening, when you've been tempted to just douse the whole thing in Roundup, to get rid of all those nasty weeds, and just once and for all, and start again. But then you haven't done it, because there are precious plants that would be killed along with the weeds. Wisdom isn't always found when our hands are holding a book. Sometimes it's found when her hands are in the soil. And so to the book of Romans and to one of the most beautiful statements in all of human literature about the relationship between humanity and our environment. For creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. The world is not as it should be. We are in pain and our world is in pain. Globally, we face pandemic and violence and climate crisis. Individually, we endure grief and anxiety. But this is not because we are in a battle with the natural world in order to bring it into submission to us. It's because humanity is not as we should be, not as we will be when we are fully formed. In pain and in redemption, we are all in this together. The world is groaning because of us. We are groaning because life is hard and the Spirit of God groans within us. All of us groaning. Humanity, God and all creation. But this is not unproductive pain. These are labour pains. New life is on its way, new creation, redemption, not just of our souls, but of our bodies. And with our bodies, the whole physical world. This has been the Christian hope for 2,000 years. And we should be grateful to our indigenous sisters and brothers around the world for reminding us of what we have always believed. There is no such thing as secular space. Wisdom can be found everywhere. And God can find you wherever you might choose to hide. 
but that's okay. Because by bringing each of us to full maturity in Christ, God is redeeming the whole world so that every single cubic centimetre of the universe will celebrate the life and freedom of Christ. So, whatever might cause you to groan this week, may you hear echoes of that eternal celebration. Amen.